Well, welcome to the Shoreline Conversations podcast. We're on episode six of our Romans series. We're talking about sovereignty today. I got to sit down and chat with Pastor Kevin, and it was a it was a fun conversation. We got a little bit off topic, on topic, uh, but it went a little long, and so uh, it's perfect though because uh, we're going to release this first uh, half of it on Sunday, and we're actually going to release the second half of it on our new release days Wednesdays. We're we're shifting to live uh, broadcasting on Sundays. And so Kevin will explain that when we get into this, but we're really excited about this new day and what's to come. And so without holding you on too much, uh, let's just get into the conversation. Well, welcome back to, uh, I think this is week six of our podcast. And uh, Kevin, I just wanted to start off with um, talking about the the new trajectory that we're going as Shoreline and and the new stuff that's happening this Sunday. So can you just kind of give us an overview of what's going on? Yeah, for all of our Shoreline folks, this will uh, will make sense in a matter. For those that are maybe guests come from other places, you may want to skim ahead for a (laughs) minute or two. Uh, But but yeah, I just would love to share with our Shoreline community, which is a large community of people, uh, that our commitment has been to take every step forward that we can within mm-hmm. the boundaries of what we have uh, in our county, in our state, uh, trying to honor those in governing authorities, uh, but also every step we can take forward, we're going to take forward. So yeah. our next step forward is going to all live worship. Yeah. And what I mean by live is we'll be meeting live in our courtyard mm-hmm. with people who can pre-register and show up there and or just show up. We always have some extra seats. And also they can be live in our parking lot in their cars, right, right, right. listening on their car radios. And then they can also be live at home watching a live stream. Right. So we've been pre-recording. You know, you call you and your yeah. team have been pre-recording the music. I've been re- pre-recording the messages. Our teams put them all together and put on a great service that was online, but not live stream what was happening right, right here on our campus. Right. So starting uh, this uh, a week from Sunday. Um, which when, when people yeah. see this podcast will be this coming Sunday. Yeah. So the actual date is the, what is the date? The 25th. The 25th. That's when we're opening. Yeah. 25th of October. Yeah. Uh, everything in our worship will be live. Yeah. Th- the important thing is to realize that that means since we're live at nine o'clock and 11 o'clock in the courtyard, we'll be live online at nine o'clock and 11 right. o'clock because it, it's, it's happening in real time. Yeah. I think we've got such great feedback from our congregation about nights of worship. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being a live stream and, and people said, why can't we? Can't we see what's actually happening? Can it be happening live? And so we're taking that next step. Right. Our, our tech team, your team, Cole, has done an amazing job of getting all the equipment, technology to make this yeah. happen. And so it's rolling out soon. Mm-hmm. We're excited. Yeah. And uh, we really believe that that will give people a sense of in real time being together, worshiping Jesus. When Absolutely. we go into a prayer, people in their cars, people in the courtyard, people up on the dock area, people at home, we're praying together, together. at the same yeah. time. There's something exciting about that. Yeah, I know. It's It's been a process and, mm-hmm. and uh, we've been... You know, met with a lot of challenges and and uh, uh, some you know roadblocks, but uh, man, the the production team has just been really amazing through this process. Rock stars. And fig- figuring yeah. this out, it's it's been a challenge to do it with uh, the quality we've been doing it, and we're we're really excited to to bring you know the people that are here on campus outdoors, and and then also the people at home kind of closer and make us feel like we're a family again and to experience worship in a better way, in a new way, in a fresh way, and to experience the sermon in a new way. So I've been, uh, I'm excited about this. I'm really excited about this. So, and the good news is we didn't know the timing of this. No. Yeah. The state didn't know the timing of this. But because God is sovereign, he knew the time <laughs> oh, of this. See, I'm, oh, he, takes it, our in. Theme of the he takes it into the theme. So we no. just tied it. Tom, Thomas, see how I wove that together with such a, <laughs> such a, such a natural uh, flow there. Yeah. So we, we, you know, this past Sunday, you, you're talking a lot about, um, you know, the sovereignty of God. And you talk about a lot of things, honestly, there's, there's a lot of, of things to go through in this portion of, of Romans, but you really have this, this uh, underpinned uh, focus on God's sovereignty. So can you just start by giving us kind of a definition? What does it mean exactly, God's sovereignty? Yeah. Well, in a, in a most narrow way, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a big really definition. Th- that God is ruler, is Lord, is the sovereign mm-hmm. over all things. Uh, so God knows what's happening, you know, which is is part of God's omniscience. God is uh, in His power, controls things. So, you know, so so a high view of sovereignty would say that you have an absolute sense that God is over all things, and God mm-hmm. is on the throne. God is in control. In some schools of thinking, it would be that actually God, God then causes everything, and we'll mm-hmm. get into the causal right. nature of, yeah. of the, if God knows something, must it happen? And there's a lot when you talk about sovereignty, uh, it's really it's really 
pulling together a lot of different things, and it influences the whole way we see the world. Right. And I remember, I remember in um, in college, one of my philosophy professors, uh, you know, philosophy jokes are hilarious. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and so I, he taught. He was talking about different schools of theology, and and people who are reformed. Uh, tend to have a very high view of God's sovereignty, and, and even to the point sometimes of saying that God is then causing all things to happen. Right, right. So he just told he told the story. You know, this reformed pastor was um, walking down the stairs and tripped halfway down the stairs, and boom, 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 fell over the bottom. And he got to the bottom. He just said, "I'm glad that's over with." <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so that would be a sense that everything's causal and you're just yeah. waiting for whatever God has planned yeah. to happen. And yeah. so, so for, for philosophers, that's hilarious <laughs> for normal people. It's like, huh? What? But, uh, anyways, yeah. Kinda so, like so, me. so, so sovereign, so sovereignty is, is really about God's authority, God's mm -hmm. power, God's plan, God's hand, God's, uh, knowledge of all things, his yeah. power over all things, uh, his, his, you know, omniscience, omnipresence, mm -hmm. omnipotence, you know, all, all that, all that God is. And, and yet within that, people define that differently. Mm -hmm. I would say that across the theological spectrum, almost every Christian you would ever meet would have a, a sense that God is sovereign. Right. He is the Lord. He is in charge. He's mm -hmm. in control of the universe. But then you say, okay, but how does that play itself out? That's where you right. get different schools of thinking. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're in your message and then also, I mean, throughout Romans and you see Paul talking uh, about a lot of things like you've, you've covered um, heritage and uh, unity, grace, re reaching the lost, this, this outreach uh, evangelistic aspect, as well as some of the stuff we've talked about before in the podcast, like sin and, and, and salvation. And, yeah. and so how does the concept of God's sovereignty then uh, tie all of those things together? Yeah, and in the sermon, I kind of use the illustration of my granny, my dad's right, mom, who was right. kind of was really kind of the matriarch in my in, in in the Harney family. Yeah, and she was sort of the glue that held our family together. Yeah. When she passed away, as a matter of fact, the way our family gathered and the way things functioned were just different because she was. And, and a lot of families have that that person, that mm -hmm. matriarch or patriarch, who just plays that role of kind of holding things together. And so when I look at all of theology, and especially when you look at the book of Romans, and you know you, you begin in chapter one with the whole discussion of sin and this right. downward spiral of right. sin, you get to chapter two, you look at God's righteousness and the call that we would be righteous, but not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. And you move through, you know, you move through faith and God's faith. You know, you walked all the way through it in Romans, and what you realize is this concept of sovereignty mm -hmm. sort of is this is this glue that holds it together, is this this hub around which things move, because if you know, if God is truly sovereign over all, He has the power to deal with sin. If God right. is sovereign, that speaks to His His power, His glory, His righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, God, you know, so so God's sovereignty really touches on everything. And right. so, so sort of in the middle of this series, we're in, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of kind of in the middle of this series, finishing up on orthodoxy, moving towards the topic of orthopraxy. Uh, but for sovereignty to kind of be in the center of it all, I think is appropriate, even in the setting of these twelve weeks of the right. series, because. If God is not sovereign, if God is not the ruler of all, that Im that impacts everything. Yeah, because God is sovereign, that touches on everything we believe and all that we do. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I was thinking a lot about that with with um, kind of the evangelistic aspect of our, of our faith and how how there's no need for that if He's not sovereign. If mm -hmm. He's not the ruler of all, why would you? Yeah, you know, I, you, you use the um, the kind of metaphor of of you know this this restaurant that i i love and I, i've been there and you you become evangelistic about it yeah. and how you tell your friends and stuff yeah. but if if it wasn't that good mm -hmm. like why you wouldn't do that and that, so it's it's interesting how his sovereignty and the the reality of that kind of dictates the rest of these things and makes them makes them important it's it's an interesting thing to go down that hole with well, but well, and, and to jump in on something you said in a sense uh you say, well, if God isn't sovereign, then why would we reach out and share the good news of, of, of his love and his mm -hmm. grace and his power? But also some people would say, if you take sovereignty to an extreme, right. some people say, then you would also not be moved to share the faith because if they say, well, if God foreknows, therefore he predestines, therefore all things will yeah. happen and we are not free agents, but we're right. simply acting on the script that God's already written, right. then why would I spend my time sharing Jesus with somebody else? Because God's already determined whether they believe it. And this is where your head can yeah, get a little bit. No, I, you can start to spin a little no, bit. No, definitely. But it's interesting. A low view of sovereignty can move us from sharing this good news of Jesus 
and a radical extreme view of sovereignty could also keep people, and does in some cases, yeah. keep people from sharing the good news of Jesus. Yeah. And that's sad because one of the greatest calls of the Word of God is to share this good news of God's love Absolutely. with the world. Yeah. And so when our theology actually gets in the way of, in the way of accomplishing what, what Jesus called us to do, mm-hmm. we better start questioning our theology and making sure it's aligning with the scriptures. Right. I mean, because I, so, you mentioned that, you know, God has this like sovereign plan uh, to save all people. I think mm-hmm. that was in your sermon. Uh, but you did also touch a little bit on the this notion of like, you know, that begs the question, mm-hmm. if God is sovereign, then why aren't all people saved? And it's yeah. kind of what you're talking yeah. about there. Is, there. is that is that kind of your response to that? Yeah, well, so I wouldn't frame it and say God has a sovereign plan to save all people. What I would say is God and his sovereignty makes salvation available to all people. Okay. Uh, and so God's grace is big enough for all people. Mm-hmm. The, the death of Jesus on the cross, his, his cry when he, said, when, when he said, you know, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You know, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said, uh, when, 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 G, when Jesus is on the cross and he, you know, he, you know, he's, saying, he's praying for us, his desire is that all would know him. Mm-hmm. And the scriptures talk about God's desire is that all would come to a knowledge of salvation, that none would perish. That's the heart of God. God's plan is to make a way for all people who will receive his grace and right. surrender to him to become part of his family. Right. Um, now, here's where the division comes. Is some people say, well, no, God's plan, uh, some, some will say, and, and, and we were talking about this before we started the podcast, yeah. uh, there's such uh, gradations and variations of yeah. thinking about this and extremes of things, uh, and it's tricky to yeah. kind of figure out, know, but what we, we have to grapple with is the whole, I believe you have to grapple with the whole of scripture. Yeah. If you take a couple of verses in the Bible out of context, mm-hmm. you can come up with an argument that says God plans the salvation and even in some cases the damnation of all people before right. time. And we are not free agents. We have no choice in that. And it is already predetermined. Mm-hmm. If I believe that was true, I wouldn't be an evangelist. Right. I'm a pastor and an evangelist. Right. I lead an organization called Organic Outreach International, where we train leaders all over the world to help their congregational members share their faith. I wouldn't D- waste no five need. minutes yeah. on that yeah. if I believed everything was predetermined. And some people will say, well, well, you should still do it anyways because it's the right thing to do or because God wants yeah. you to. Even though what you're doing is going to make no difference, it's That's, the right thing to do. Yeah. You tell any kid that and you tell any adult who are really adults are just big kids, yeah. um, listen, listen, what you're going to do is going to make no difference at all. Zero. Yeah but you're supposed to do it. Yeah. Go for it. The motivation, is, let's call it, is, is, is reasonably low. <laughs> reasonably, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just doing it because I'm supposed to. And, and I've interacted with people across the whole continuum. Yeah. Uh, and so there are people who have a very, a very uh, distinct view of God's sovereignty as being predetermining, predestining, deciding in yeah. advance, uh, and even in a two-way predestination, which would be a predestination to salvation and to damnation. Right. Um, you know, I personally don't see that in the Bible. Yeah. But again, if you take a couple of verses, you can, you can build that you case. You can get there. Yeah. And and then you have other people that push the other way and just say, basically, it's 100% up to us and God's hand is not in it at all. It's just about our decision. Right. And I think the Bible teaches that God is actively involved. God is sovereign. He right. is wooing. He is drawing. He's made a way. Mm-hmm. He desires that all would come to a knowledge of salvation. But at the end of the day, if we don't receive this gift of grace, so God, so God offers the gift. I mean, it literally says, this is for you. My son died. He paid yeah. the price, the, the substitutionary atonement. He literally died in your place for your sins. Yeah. If you'll receive this gift, his righteousness becomes yours yeah. and you become a child of God. And if, if people say, I don't want it, or people say, well, I'm going to suspend judgment. Mm-hmm. Suspending judgment, at least for now, is saying no. And so, so is it our decision or is it God's work? Right. Well, I believe it's both. We could never be saved without the work of Jesus. Yeah. We don't have the power to do that. But God will not drag us into his kingdom screaming and kicking. Yeah. Uh, he offers a way and invites us in. Right. And so I think we walk that, that theological tension uh, between God's sovereignty and work and will and our human free agency and right. choice in the same way that, that most Christians would say, uh, well, I would say all biblical Christians would say that Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God. Mm-hmm. Even though even though our minds don't 
fully get that. I mean, you right. can say, okay, the cup's completely full of divinity and the cup's completely full of humanity. Put it together, it overflows, and yet it all fits together, it coalesces, mm-hmm. and, and Jesus was fully God and fully man. Orthodox Christians believe that. We say, I don't totally understand it, yeah. but the scripture teaches his, his, huma- his divinity and his humanity. We would say, Orthodox Christians would say, I believe that God is one being in three persons, mm-hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, in the same way, we would I, I think biblical Christians should grapple with the idea that God is sovereign and he moves and he calls and he woos us to himself and he offers salvation to all and he desires that all will be saved. But God is also um, a God who has said, in my sovereignty, I give you free agency. I give you a choice. Right. And so I call you to myself. I woo you to myself. I offer my grace. But ultimately, you get to choose. Mm-hmm. And But again, then somebody will say, and I could go on and on. I'll, I'll let yeah. you jump in with your next uh, next question. Yeah. But um, but but we you know we can look and say, okay, so if God knows in advance, which I believe He does, I believe that God knows all things. Yeah. So if God knows in advance what's going to happen, can it not happen? And then. You say, okay, well, then if he knows in advance and it, and it can't not happen, it must happen, then it's predestined and you have no free agency. Right. Yeah. So can it be that God foreknows what we will choose freely? And this is why this is why we're having a podcast. Because, <laughs> no, yeah. Cole, we are going to figure this we're out. We're going to do it. We're going to nail it now. We're going to put a bow on it. That's our commitment to, exactly. to the viewers and the listeners. Per- yeah. No, and, and so, so what's your, but what's your time out? To be, to be clear, you're talking about Calvinism and Armenianism. Yeah. Um, and I always, I always mispronounce Armenianism. Is that right? It depends what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, the, the question is, are you talking about, about a group of people somewhere in the world? Or are you talking yeah, about a theological disposition? The theological disposition. Okay. <laughs> Armenianism. Yeah. Um, Just say it three times fast. No, nah, that's bad. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's what, you know, these two camps, these two yeah. categories. And I, I know that in each one, there's that we, like we were saying, there's a, this like gradation of like different levels, broad of, spectrum, very broad yeah. in, in both, yeah. both uh, aspects. So um, there's something about that though, that when in your sermon, you were saying, you know, people try to get you to say like what you are yeah. or, or to, to commit to something. And, mm-hmm. and I, I love your response um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one that sticks out to me, your response is, uh, you know, I'm a biblical Christian mm-hmm. And ask me a specific question, yeah. uh, and then we can talk about that. We'll because chat, yeah. the the thing that that stands out to me about that is in this, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for you to make a stand on something that's so broad, yeah. that so has so many aspects to it, and then they they put you into a a, a hole, and that's that's who you with, are. With one and, word, with yeah, one word, yeah. and it's just useless. And you see yeah. that yeah. like rampant disease yeah. today. It's yeah. it's. Yeah. It's terrible, yeah. and so I, that's why I love your your response because you can say like I I'm pursuing the biblical mm-hmm. response to this, yeah. and, and I, so and, and, we're, and I grapp- and I, I'm grappling and yeah, with it's, it. It's yeah. a hard thing to and I, and I would yeah. and I would commend and have and would commend this response to anybody listening. Yeah, as you're listening, I commend this to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking to you, but I, yeah. I can say I know that there's people listening. No, this and, is and really helpful. Are, and, and those that are watching, I'm looking at the camera. If you're just <laughs> listening, you have no idea what I'm doing right now. But uh, but I commend it to people because I think it leads to peace. It yeah. leads to conversation. It can lead to uh, a more intelligent interaction between yeah. human beings. We become so polarized in so many ways. Yeah. And people are just about labeling. You know, they're about, you know, if you can, if you can tweet it and label it and say it in 15 to 30 seconds, it's probably not worth much. Yeah. Um, we've got it. We've got to get more intentional about conversing and talking. So, so I, I had a, um, a first year college student I knew who went away to college and went away to a Bible school. Yeah. And they studied uh, Reformed theology and Armenian theology. And they came back and, uh, and the first time I interacted with them after being a, gone for their first semester of college. Mm-hmm. And they said, are you Reformed or Armenian? And, and I, and, and I think they said it because this is someone who had heard me preach and teach and realize that I will sometimes preach these things that sometimes sound reformed and sometimes sound Arminian. Yeah. There's a reason, you know, people who are reformed and people who are Arminian uh, theologically get their ideas from the Bible. Right. Well, I work from just one book as a pastor. I only got yeah. one book. I got lots of books in my library, but when I preach, teach, there's really one book that is based on, and that's mm-hmm. the Bible. So if you preach from the Bible effectively, you're going to cross those theological right. spectrums, right? And so I said to this, this person, they said, are you reformed or Arminian? I said, I said, I'm a biblical Christian. Ask me a specific question. 
I'll give you a thoughtful answer. We can have a conversation. Yeah. They said, no, just are you reformed or Arminian? And I said, not going to answer the question. And they got a little bit, they got a little bit miffed and, <laughs> and uh, that's the theological term, yeah, miffed. miffed. Yeah. Uh, but they, they were, they were a little bit irritated at me and they, and they, and, and they said, well, you know, my professor said that people who won't, won't answer that question are hiding. Yeah. And I said, well, your professor's um, <laughs> not, not as smart as he or she thinks they are uh, <laughs> th- be- because they they were forcing young students yeah. to create this dichotomy and, and to, to fall into this trap of one word. You know, for most people, if they ask you a question like that in the same, in the same, in the theological world, a question like that is not unlike in the political world, somebody saying, are you Republican or Democrat? Mm-hmm. Most people, when they ask that question, they believe in their mind that if you say one word, they know everything about you. Yeah. They know what you believe about yeah. everything, but no one is that simple. And you even fall in line with these other people and these other groups that yeah. do certain things. You're yeah. like, it's not. I how know it what works. you believe. I yeah. know who you align with. I know everything about you, and that that is so juvenile. Yeah. It is so. It is. It really is. And so, for me to say, I'm a biblical Christian. Uh, ask me a specific question. I'll give you a specific answer. We can have a conversation. Mm-hmm. I had. Uh, I had a leading evangelistic voice it yeah. was a friend of mine call me and no no tweet uh, uh, texted me yeah and just said uh, hey harney are you uh complementarian or egalitarian which is about women in ministry and that's a whole different podcast yeah. we don't want to do that but but um and i and i responded back i'm a biblical christian <laughs> ask me and he, and he and he responded back dude just give me an answer yeah and i said not even with you i don't it's it's not that simple yeah, uh, none of these it's are so text. simple that Ugh. one and, and and here's and here's the deeper problem, Cole. And this is the deeper problem: is not only simplistic, but when a person when, when if five different people come to me mm-hmm. and say, and we'll stay on the political strain because that's more probably more understandable for yeah. most people. If five different people come to me and say, "Are you Republican or Democrat?" If I say one or the other, every one of them has a different vision of what that means. Absolutely, not yeah. one of them means the same thing. They don't. Yeah. And so, so I'll say, you know, ask me a question, ask me what I believe about life and we'll have a great conversation. Yeah. I'll, I'll open up Psalm 139. We'll open yeah. up the scriptures. We'll talk about, we'll talk about life. We'll talk about when, when Jesus and John the Baptist met for the first time yeah. in the womb, yeah. when Mary and Elizabeth met. And there's this interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist before they're born. Mm-hmm. We can talk about Jeremiah and and Jeremiah being told in the very beginning, in chapter one of Jeremiah, that you know before you were born, God said, "I called." Talk about sovereignty. I called you to be a prophet to the yeah. nations, right? And so you know, we'll open the scriptures. We'll talk now. I may start talking about my view of life, and people might say, "Oh, now I know where you stand on yeah, everything." Yeah. No, you don't. you don't. You know where I stand on this topic because that's yeah. all we're talking about. Yeah. And so I would commend anybody and everybody listening when somebody asks you, "Are you this or this?" and it's clear to you that they have in their mind a, a, a picture of what that means. Uh, just don't acquiesce to that, that pressure yeah. and just say, I, I think you can say, well, you know, and if, if you're a Christian yeah. and if you're seeking to be biblical, you can say, I'm a biblical Christian. I'd love to talk about all kinds of things, but, but the categorizing me with one term uh, and then moving back to, you know, theologically, uh, I'm ordained in mm-hmm. the reformed church in America. But when after 14 years of serving in a church that was a reformed church, Mm -hmm. I took three and a half years to write the organic outreach books for my wife and I to research and begin to launch what's become Organic Outreach International. Mm -hmm. And in that season, I had a Wesleyan church contact me. Uh, large their, their worship center seats like four thousand four thousand five hundred people. I remember yeah. one time I preached there for I preached there for three and a half years. They mm-hmm. they called me to be a preaching pastor, and I said yes. And I preached at this Wesleyan church, which is Arminian in theology, for three and a half years. At the same time, uh, the largest Reformed church in the country asked me to be their teaching pastor in the Chicago area, and I was driving out there every month preaching. So I was actually preaching in a church that's that's fundamental theology was Reformed, another one that's fundamental theology was Arminian, for three and a half years. And I never once had anyone, pastor, elder, or church member, come up to me and say, what you preached was out of line with what we believe. Yeah. Now, it's not because I'm mushy. Anybody who knows me knows I'm very precise yeah. and clear in my theology, but I preach the Bible. Yeah. And there's a reason that large groups of people stand in those two different places, because the Bible actually addresses both sides of these. Yeah. And I think the wisest Christian is one who grapples with both, which is why saying I'm this or that 
isn't the wisest approach. I think the wisest approach is to say, let's talk about it item by item. Well, that takes time and we have to think and have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's called yeah. being human beings. Yeah, Let, yeah. Let's, let's, let's stop uh, you know, tweeting a, a you know, 25 word response mm -hmm. to something that volume has been written about yeah. and let's have conversations. Yeah. Now I'm getting yeah. fired up here, Cole. So I'm gonna, I know. I'm gonna settle I, down when you, as you move back to your prepared text and ask me another question. <laughs> no, so. I know. no, I, I, it's, it's so helpful. It really is so helpful for people to realize and to know and understand that, that it's number one, I, it's something that you kind of gave permission, not that we needed it from you, but like, mm -hmm. I just, it, it helps people accept the, the fact that they can just say, I'm, I'm, I can't answer that for you. Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not going to give you that. The honestly, I think a lot of it is satisfaction for that other person. Oh yeah. They're, they're looking to know, are you on my team mm -hmm. or am I against you? And it's, and, it's and, not and, that and now clear. to the point where do I like you or do I hate you? Yeah. It's terrible. It used to, it used to be kind of, you know, do you, do we, it used to be, do we align in our thinking and then are there, we on the same team and now it's, are you a human being? Yeah. And uh, because it's some people, like, if you, if you say the wrong word, you're disqualified from the human family. Yeah. It's gotten so vicious. No, I know. Um, and, and to me, people that can be that satisfied that simply with a one word answer mm -hmm. are not people whose intellect I feel compelled to, um, to respect or to honor because yeah. if they really feel like they can, um, decide they don't like you, that you are, that you, there's something wrong with you because you say one word, they know what it means. And now you're not only not on my team, but you're not really even fully human. I mean, it, yeah. think, think about how severe it's gotten. No, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It is. It's, and it's, as Christians, we have to, you know, do whatever we can to lead the way in, yeah. in being filled with grace, mm -hmm. being patient, yep. good grief. Do we need patience? Um, and, yeah, I, th I think that this is a, a really helpful tool uh, in a, the way that we approach theology and the way that we approach um, relationships and the way that we approach, um, you know, politics or even meeting new people. And yeah. I just, yeah, it's, it's a helpful thing when you're, when you were kind of going through that in your sermon, I was like, Oh, we need to, we need to talk about that more. Yeah. Cause it's, it, yeah. we desperately need that. So can I, um, can I uh, chime in real quick? Please. Here? Yes, please, you please. can. I, I believe you can because you have. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I can probably speak for a lot of listeners when they enjoy when Kevin gets fired up. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I agree. To 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 kind of um, uh, just go on this. I know this is sort of off topic, but it's. I think this is really interesting. Um, talking about people getting caught up in these labels and these yeah. um, really stringent, strictly defined uh, people groups. The Bible warning us in a lot of places to beware of false teachers. And I yeah. think a lot of people think, well, I'm not smart enough to figure all this out. So I'm just going to subscribe to this yeah. total whole package worldview. Uh, somebody smarter than me and they figured it out. And this is how I feel. How do we as Christians um, approach that carefully and cautiously that we're not, not only falling into those things ourselves, but mm -hmm. we're not projecting that onto other people. Yeah. Um, how do we, in, in my mind, the, the question is how do we beware of false teachers, which, yeah. which it yeah. seems mm -hmm. is sort of the case here. Well, the first thing I would say is, uh, read the small text. Um, right. you know, in, we live in a world now, we live in a world now where, uh, you get something pops up on your screen and it says, you know, do you agree with this? And it's this little box, and if you scroll, it scrolls down for like 50, 60 swipes or whatever, <laughs> and you just go to the bottom, you just go, agree, right? We don't, we don't read the small text anymore. Yeah. We don't, a lot of times, we don't read the big text. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that part of it is just is sort of reclaiming, I don't want to call it a lost art, but in, in some, some circles and some places it is, yeah. of slowing down, of listening, of realizing the humanity of other people. Yeah. Uh, that, that this idea right now, we, we live in a, a, this is a whole other term, you know, they have a cancel culture where somebody yeah. says something or does something or someone they know says or does something yeah. <laughs> or they, they link, they link something to somebody that they, this group yeah. doesn't like. And all of a sudden you are now one of them. You are the enemy. You mm -hmm. are not a human being. You are whatever, whatever terminology they would use. Or and sometimes it's not even terminology. It's just like, click, I'm shutting you out. Yeah. People, people do that with family members, with friends. Yeah. Uh, and so... You know, to, to Thomas's question, as followers of Jesus, I think we 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 read read the, the text of the Bible and mm -hmm. we realize that in the in the gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you walk alongside of and watch this man named Jesus, who was God who was with us, who interacted with every possible pe people group with the same 
profound grace and kindness. The, the, the only time he got consistently kind of severe was actually with the religious leaders. Yeah, yeah. Um, the people who thought they had all the answers and were kind of boxing other people out. Mm -hmm. But you read John 3 and 4, and you see Jesus interacting in John 3 with a guy named Nicodemus, educated on the, on the Supreme Court of yeah, his day, right. the Sanhedrin. Um, Nicodemus is, is uh, wealthy, powerful, influential, and Jesus treated him with grace and kindness, but also really challenged him. Mm -hmm. You turn the page to John chapter 4, and Jesus is interacting with a woman at the well. She's been married. It didn't work out. Married. It didn't work out. Married. It didn't go out. It goes on and on. Now she's living with a guy who she's not married to. In the ancient world, that was uh, that was just a, a thing that would make make you uh, push you to the to the periphery of the of the cultural yeah. kind of scene. And so this woman was an outcast. She came to the, this well in the middle of the day because she didn't want to go in the morning and the evening when the women came because she was an outcast. Yeah. And Jesus treated her with such grace and such kindness. He disagreed with her on a number yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah. But they talked about it. They had a conversation. Uh, they, they talked about, you know, she said, well, where's the right place to worship? You know, we Samaritans worship here on Mount Gerizim. You guys worship in Jerusalem at, on Mount Zion. What's the right mountain? And Jesus says, you know, the day is coming, has already come, where true worshipers won't worship. It's not about the place, yeah. but we'll worship in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. But the depth of theology Jesus goes into with this, with this broken, hurting woman. Now, in those days, a man would not normally talk with a woman in, in public. But a Samaritan woman. But a Jewish rabbi talking yeah. to a Samaritan woman, totally unheard of. Yeah. And, and here Jesus just engages. And, and this is why I like to say to people, I'm not going to give you a title. Ask me questions. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Because when I walk with Jesus through the Gospels, he, he asked questions. He, gave, he asked more questions than he gave answers. He loved asking questions. He loved listening to people. And right now, most people are just sort of waiting for somebody to shut their mouth so they can jump in and give them their, their kind of pre-prepared you know, apologetic response, whether it's from a Christian worldview, a political yeah. worldview, um, a societal worldview, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so so t to me, counteracting this is, uh, for Christians, is knowing what we believe and right. holding it with conviction, but holding it like the one whose name we bear, mm -hmm. and his name is Jesus. And Jesus did not prejudge people. Jesus did not box people out. Um, in another account, uh, when, when a woman is brought before Jesus, who's been caught, it says in the text, in the act of adultery. Yeah. So this, this, that's a very specific terminology. Yeah. Obviously, if she was caught in the act of adultery, she's not alone. Mm -hmm. You don't get caught in the act of adultery alone. Yeah. She was with a man. Yeah. Uh, the man wasn't there. He wasn't brought before Jesus. She was. So he extended incredible grace, but he also spoke the truth. And he says, he, he, he says, you know, he tells the crowd, the one who's not sinned throw the first stone. And the text says that one by one, starting with the oldest, they dropped the stones, they walked out of the courtyard and they left. So here's Jesus and the woman. Jesus is bending down, drawing in the, in the sand. We don't know what he's drawing. People speculate. We have no idea. Yeah. He looks up at the woman. I get the sense that he's still kind of kneeling down, looking up at her. Instead of looking down on her as an authority, he looks up at her with kindness. And he says, where are they, woman? Where are, they, where are those who condemn you, who persecute you? And, she, and she's, you know, she basically says, they're gone. They're not here. So, you know, there's no one here to condemn me. And so Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Grace, truth. Mm -hmm. we, we've moved towards sort of a, a graceless dogmatic truth in some cases or a truthless dogmatic grace that yeah. just says everything goes. Yeah. And and that is a whole other podcast. But, yeah. but I mean, th th these are the kind of things. So, so I feel like... For Christians, and Cole, you sort of touched on this earlier, we have a moment in time right now where if we could be the ones who would listen to people, hear them, not not necessarily agree with everything they say, mm -hmm. and G Jesus clearly disagreed with things but still loved people and treated them with grace, I think our actions of grace could show the presence of the author of grace, who is Jesus. And I think it's a great opportunity for Christians to show that we are not going to react like much of the world is reacting. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many Christians are are battling each other with the same kind of tones and hostility. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, because I didn't grow up in the church, I think is part of the reason I didn't grow up in the church. When I became a Christian, I thought, hey, this is great. Yeah. All these Christians, they just love each other and they just work together. They're, we're, we're a team. Yeah. And then you even get divisions there. So, uh, Thomas, how, how close did that approximate getting to what you were thinking about? Is that, was, that, was that helpful? I like it. I like it. <laughs> good. good. As you're, you're in charge of all the knobs and buttons. i got to keep you happy. Yeah. Th th and thank you for jumping in, Thomas. Yeah. So that's the end of the first half of this conversation. Uh, we'll be releasing the next one this Wednesday. So be sure to tune in. Thank you for listening.
Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week with another one.